Injection Molding at Home, Part 2. I've been making molds for silicon and for recycled PLA. Let's have a look at what went well and what needs to improve. This video is the second in a short series on restoring this hobby injection molder. In part one, I gave an overview and then tore everything down to unseize some parts before rewiring and completing a test heat cycle. In this video, we cover the next step in this journey, which is designing and manufacturing some molds. Last time round, after unsticking this valve rod, I needed to apply some new O-rings and the ones I had on hand were just for general plumbing use, which meant they were gonna melt at around 100 degrees Celsius. I plan to mold PLA at at least 200C, so obviously I needed a better solution. Before releasing that video, I went to my local industrial shop and ordered some Viton O-rings. This is the same material as the originals that came in the injection molder and the same material that many of you recommended. I also ordered some lubricant designed for O-rings as I figured it would slow down any degradation. The problem is that I had to drill out part of this machine to be able to get the valve rod to slide back and forth like it's meant to. And that means that these or any other off the shelf O-rings aren't quite a perfect fit. They're either too narrow and don't seal the bore, or like here, they're just a little bit too big, which means they're going to need a lot of manipulation just to squish them into place. And they're probably gonna tear soon after that. What I really wanted to do was to cast my own silicon washers. So I watched this video from CNC Kitchen to get some pointers. Rather than use a two-part silicon like he did, I instead use this RTV silicon for automotive use that was rated up to 650 degrees Fahrenheit or around 340 degrees Celsius. RTV stands for Room Temperature Vulcanizing. In short, that means the silicon will set by itself without any special tools or conditions. Another advantage is that RTV is meant to have excellent release properties, meaning I shouldn't need a release agent, I can just 3D print a mold and cast the silicon washers I want directly inside it. So to design a simple mold is exactly what I did. I needed three washers in total, so each row can take four so I have a spare, and then the clearances differ very slightly for each row, so I could find the exact size that I wanted. So with this method, not only would I have a larger range of safe temperatures, but I wouldn't be limited by the sizes of off-the-shelf O-rings. I printed two copies of the mold, one with ironing turned on that you can see here, and one without. The idea being that the version with ironing would have a smoother surface on the inside of the mold. Now this part of the process I really did not enjoy. It cramped up my hand and it was very hard to deliver the silicon in the right amount. What I tried to do was squeeze a bead the whole way into the base of the mold and then follow that around the circular pattern so I wouldn't have any air bubbles. I then thought I'd use a finger to smooth over the top but I immediately regretted this. It just made a mess everywhere. The more I did, the better my technique got, but to be honest, this was still pretty average, and that two-part silicon was starting to look pretty attractive. Nonetheless, I ended up with two full molds, and then all I had to do was wait. Sometimes I can be very impatient, but in this case, I actually waited the 24 hours that I was meant to. To clean up the top, I got a razor blade and delicately ran it back and forth to take a thin slice and try and get the top flat and flush with the mold. Again, I wasn't that good at this, but it actually seemed to work pretty well. But after that, everything seemed to go wrong. Do you remember how Wikipedia promised me that this would self-release and I wouldn't need any release agent? Well, the reality was the opposite. This silicon had well and truly bonded to the PETG mold. I tried a range of pointy tools, but I couldn't find any way to release it without tearing the surface. I eventually got one out, but only after it disintegrated into many little pieces. I tried drilling out the center to see if it will give me better access to the silicon, but it was still bonded. And in an act of what can only be called desperation, I even tried to heat up and soften the PETG, hoping it might start to melt and fall away from the silicon. But as you can see, that was also an absolute disaster. Frustrated, I went shopping online and ordered some release agent suitable for RTV silicon. It wasn't cheap, but I'm sure I'll find a use for it in future. In the meantime, I printed a new mold and my friend Andy asked his dad, who's an industrial chemist, and he suggested I use petroleum jelly, in this case Vaseline, as a release agent. I used a paintbrush to install a thin coating inside the new mold. It was thick at the start, but at least it was thin by the time I spread it around. And then back to my favorite job a third time of squirting the RTV silicon into the mold. At least I am slowly getting much better at it. 
22 and a half hours later, I got out the razor blade and once again trimmed off the tops of each washer. And I need to buy Andy's data present because this time the O-rings released thanks to the Vaseline. Their quality was quite variable. In some cases they didn't quite fill the mold and they were more like an O-ring than a washer, but the best ones were pretty close to flat on both sides. And surely these would be good enough for my application. I got out my fancy lubricant and applied it to the inside of the injection molder bore and slid down the smallest silicon washer into place on the valve rod. And annoyingly, I soon ran into the same problem as the oversized O-rings. When installed on the rod, the diameter had changed to the point where it was a tight squeeze and I could force it through. However, with that came consequences. As I tested the movement, I could see that it was being torn up by the hole because it was just too squishy in there. So because of the clearances being wrong, there was no way that my silicon washer was going to last. There's just too much damage from all of that rubbing. Frustratingly, I think it's going to take a fair bit more time to cast variations until I get the size just right. I just got to be patient. But don't worry, I did get another part of the project finished, so let's inspect this plastic mold. The first step in machining a custom mold was to prepare the materials and some cutters for the CNC router. Here we have some 10mm aluminium plate. So if I have two mold halves milled from this, the maximum object thickness can be somewhere around 16 to 18 millimeters. To prep this, I cut down some MDF to act as a spoil board, and then employed a method told to me by my patrons. I lined the MDF spoil board with blue painter's tape, and then lined one side of the aluminium plate, also with blue tape, matching the same pattern and spacing. When that's done, we apply a thin bead of super glue, and then mount the spoil board to the underside of the aluminium stock. And once I've finished clamping the stock down to the CNC router, I can cut the whole way through the job without leaving any support tabs which saves some time once it comes to post-processing. I already had plenty of flat end mills, so to supplement this, I purchased some Dremel tungsten carbide ball-ended engraving bits. I picked up some dimensions for these from the Dremel website, and then entered these as new tools in my free cam software, Kirimoto. The first question is what to design a mold for, and many of you commented that I should injection mold a benchy in the last video, but the reality is the geometry of the benchy makes this near impossible. The mold would have to be so complicated to be able to move into all these internal cavities that it's really not worth it. So instead I went for something much simpler. This is a system to mount your mobile phone to your bike handlebars and I need to replace it because I have a new phone that doesn't fit and also because it suffered a breakage. Now the way that this is printed makes it susceptible to failing along the layer lines and since injection molding inserts all of the plastic in a single go, we don't have any of these weaknesses. We also don't need to worry about which way it's oriented on the print bed. So for my first project, I'm going to do part of this bracket, and it looks pretty simple, but you'll soon see designing a mold for it is fairly involved. Here's a version of the part that I'm aiming for, but you can't mold it exactly as you see it here. The first thing we need to do is to apply this angle to the two halves, a feature that we call draft. And basically what this is for is allowing the easy release of the object from the mold, whereas if these walls were completely vertical, the object might get stuck inside the cavity. My aim is to have a two-part mold and both halves being symmetrical and identical. So I started by modeling the part, but only one half and without the holes, which we'll get to later. From there, we can make a simple rectangular prism and use a Boolean cut to remove the cavity of our part. The next feature might surprise you and it's a cutout for an N5 bolt to rest in place. If instead I had modeled this with the half hole already in place, when I did the Boolean cut, you would see this segment would be in place and the part would be impossible to remove. We still need material here to form the hole in the final part, but we need to be smarter in how we achieve that. So if instead we have a cutout for a bolt to sit, plastic can be injected in, surround the bolt, leaving our hole, and then we simply unscrew the bolt at the end. Next, we need a way to get the plastic in, which is this entry at the top, and then we have these two exit holes where any trapped air can push its way out and hopefully remove the chance of any parts of the cavity not being filled with plastic. After this, we have a series of holes where we'll put a bolt through to clamp the two halves of the mold together. And then three additional larger holes where I'm going to put a bolt through to act as a locating pin. And while it might seem that there's a lot going on, this is everything required just to mold this very simple part. Onto the cam then, and I'm using Kirimoto, which is completely free and open source. And as a bonus, has a Carvera preset with everything ready to go. For this job, I used four operations, and unfortunately, I made some errors. Nothing critical, but for now, we'll do a quick overview, and then we'll come back later to explain what went wrong. 
The first operation is roughing, basically removing all of the excess material from inside each pocket. This uses a concentric toolpath going down layer by layer. We then switch to one of the ball cutters and do a contour pass going back and forth in a zigzag along the X axis. The idea was this is where we will get the fine detail and a smooth surface. We then follow that up with the same type of path, except this time zigzagging back and forth on the Y axis. And finally, we switch back to the flat end mill and do an outline pass to completely cut out the holes and the exterior perimeter. Kirimoto has the benefit that we can simulate the whole job to make sure that everything looks okay. And as far as I was concerned, it absolutely did, so I exported the G-code and sent it to the machine. The actual machining was the straightforward bit. I'm using this Carvera more and more, and it's becoming like one of my 3D printers, where I just send the job to it, set and forget. I trust it completely. This is the first time I've run a time lapse, and it was cool to see the tool changer in action, the first operation using the end mill, and then the ball mill for the second and third, before it returns to pick up the end mill again to cut out the perimeter. And of course, at the beginning, it uses the wireless probe to measure the top surface of the stock, just like ABL on a 3D printer. When the first half of the mold was done, I used a flathead screwdriver to leave it in between the remaining stock and the machined part. With a little bit of pressure, it breaks the adhesion of the tape underneath and the part releases, meaning I can pull it straight out. This really is a great system compared to leaving tabs because I don't have to take the whole piece of stock downstairs to cut the job free from the block. From here, I cut the second half of the mold directly above the first. And after vacuuming out the chips, here are the two halves of the mold straight off the machine. Clearly the general shape is there, but we can see from the top here we've got some rather pronounced stair stepping. Basically, we can see the equivalent of 3D printer layer lines, where the cutting bit was moving down layer by layer, and this means the shapes aren't quite right, and some of the cavities, for instance this one to hold the M5 bolt, aren't quite deep enough. So what exactly went wrong? If we pause the simulation in Kirimoto, Right at the end of the roughing stage, we can see that we have the prominent stair steps like in the final object. And it seems to me, the fine detailing of the contour passes just didn't take place. And I think that's due to a rounding error when inputting the dimensions of the Dremel ball mill. On the Dremel website, they list the diameter as 3.2mm. But then in the technical data, they instead list it as 3175 And after the job, when I finally checked it with my calipers, I found the widest sections of the tip to be more like 3.1 millimeters, but I had already input 3.2 into Kirimoto and there lies the problem. Here is a simplified representation of what we'd be left with after our roughing pass. The ball nose cutter would then be introduced to clean everything up. With the cam software positioning it to cut off a certain amount of material, and if everything goes well that should leave a pretty clean result. But in our case, the exterior dimensions of the cutter are wrong. It's smaller than real life, but Kirimoto doesn't know this and positions it as if it was the correct size. But of course that means not enough material will be cut away and the end result still has some prominent stair stepping. So for me, lesson learnt, measure cutting bits myself rather than rely on vague measurements on the website. There were some other little things that I learned and I will apply to future molds, but for now, let's get this one cleaned up. Job one is to cut a thread in those three larger holes on one side of the mold to create the locating pins. M5 bolts are inserted and the opposite holes are drilled out to five millimeters. With a little bit of wiggling, the two halves now come together and stay nicely aligned until I'd like to pull them apart. So now we can turn our attention to a little cleanup. I inserted some of the M4 clamping bolts along the bottom edge of the mold. I then drilled out the bores where the M5 bolts are meant to sit so that they could actually rest in their intended position. But of course, that's only half the story because the cavity where the bolt heads sit was still far too shallow. I figured the easiest way to rectify this was to break out the rotary tool and get grinding. Unfortunately, it really didn't take too much time before enough material was removed that the bolt could sit in place and the two halves closed together properly. You might remember our air escape holds on the side of the mold. Well, thanks to my cam error, they're non-existent, so I needed to drill them manually. I should have used a drill press for this. The end result is they're slightly crooked, but they'll still function as they need to. And for now, that concludes our CNC aluminium mold. It's not gonna be quite as nice as I wanted, but this is just a test piece, and I really think there's no point machining the mold again until I've done some actual injection molding and inevitably learned some more lessons. I'm sure, like me, you're frustrated that I haven't actually injection molded anything yet, 
but the reality is sometimes things just don't go to plan and we need to be patient and get them right before proceeding. But don't worry, I promise for part three, I'll make sure I have everything working before I make a video on that. Make sure to leave your feedback for any of this down in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy successful mold making at home. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.